Hello and welcome to Access Rhode Island. My name is Elizabeth Burke Bryant, Executive Director of Rhode Island Kids Count. And today's program is Kids Count on Access Rhode Island. Every Kids Count show, we have the opportunity to bring you a very important issue affecting Rhode Island's children, youth, and families. And today's topic is a very serious one and one that we can all join in helping turn around. And that is the topic of children at risk, whether they are at risk for child abuse and neglect, at risk for mental health difficulties, or at risk for involvement in the juvenile justice system. And we couldn't have two better guests than the ones that are joining us for today's Access Rhode Island program. First, I'd like to introduce Brother Michael Reese. Brother Michael Reese is the Executive Director of Tides Family Services. It's great to have you on the program. Thank you for inviting me. And next to Brother Reese is Ben Lessing. Ben is the head of Community Action. Here I'm going to completely botch your name because I'm thinking about things to come. Um, <laughs> so if you could say the name of your organization, I apologize. Um, family I'm, Resources, I'm the Community Director, Action. Family Resources, Community Action. Okay, so well, let me start that again okay. to welcome you from Family Resources, Community Action. And it's great to have both of you on the program. Um, Family Resources Community Action has been such an outstanding partner organization to so many people who work in the child welfare field. Ben, your leadership of that organization has been outstanding. Thank and we you. know that based on your incredible work um, in other states, including Massachusetts, you really bring to your work in Rhode Island a lot of experience that we could do well to pay attention to. So thank you for your partnership over the years. Thank and you. Brother Michael, you know, it goes without saying Tides Family Services is really doing such great work on the front lines, you know, with the nightly and daily tracking of youngsters that are either in the child welfare system just coming out or at risk of getting more and more involved. And we know you have a family-centered approach. So thank you for being on the program. So this is really, I think, you know, Ben and I were talking before the program began about the fact that this is a continuum. And we are just um, really wanting to cover a lot of ground in this conversation t today. And I think we want to start really from where we probably want to end as well, and that is prevention. Mm. So Ben, could you just tell us a little bit about your background um, before you got to Family Resources Community Action? I know you have had a lot of different um, roles that you've played in this field. So sure. if you could tell our viewers about your background, that would be awesome. Sure. I. Um I spent uh, a good part of my career in community mental health. I began working in Woonsocket in 1981 uh, through uh, 1992, and from there um, left the state, went to Massachusetts, worked for a couple of nonprofits, and uh, ended up in the, working in the child welfare system as an administrator in the child welfare system. And there I was involved in some, some fairly large uh, system change efforts. Um, designed to bring community-based services closer to child welfare services. And, uh, and we did that on a statewide basis and we were able to really serve families more comprehensively and to tailor services for families. And then in 2000, I, um, I um, was hired at Family Resources, then Family Resources, who immediately merged with the local community action agency um, and became family resources community action and really the um, the significance of that was that we were able to do a, we were able to be comprehensive in terms of our service delivery so we we do a lot of work with people living in poverty and almost every family that we serve from the child welfare system um, for the most part is living in poverty or on the edge and so we're able to work with them around employment and housing and basic needs as well as other child welfare uh, types of programs or other clinical types of programs. And um, in seven days, we, we become Community Care Alliance because we're merging with NRI community services. And so we will have a, a broad continuum of over 60 programs that will be able to provide everything from basic needs to to mental health services and uh, we are very excited about that because we think that for the people that we serve we're really going to be able to to add a lot of value to their services 
Well, congratulations on that uh, soon to be you. merger. And I think that's what caused me to stumble so much because I was already <laughs> thinking about your new name and stumbling over whether to use your new name or your old name. But new name or old name, um, as, as um, I was thinking that, that that merger is going to just increase the, um, the number and array of services yep. to your already very, very impressive array of services. So um, people in Rhode Island are going to be looking forward to that new iteration mm -hmm. of what has been a long a really long successful track record of both groups. So congrats on that in Thank advance. You. Thank you. Um, and I think that you mentioned a key word, poverty. Um, mm. You know, I think we talk about poverty a lot on the Rhode Island Kids mm. Count program. A family living in poverty right now is living with a family of three uh, at a little under $19,000 for a family of three. Very, very difficult to get by. Um, and yet we know poverty, as we say at Rhode Island Kids Count, is the number one indicator we track because it makes a difference to every single other thing Absolutely. that we track. Yeah. Um, and so the comprehensive approach that you take at your agency is best practice, right? It's, it's, it's not ignoring some things while you handle others. Right. Do you think that that is a prominent enough lens for child welfare work in general? I think that it has to be going forward. I think it has to be, I think comprehensiveness really has to be the focus. And I think we're, I think we're at a point now where, when we really need to move away from sort of single design programs and we have to be able to look at the whole family and we have to look at the whole family's needs so that, you know, it's in many ways child welfare systems historically have looked at only the kids and it's important to look at the kids and it's important to keep the kids safe it's important to deal with whatever trauma they've experienced but if you're not also working with parents if you're not also attending to their mental health issues or their substance use issues or the fact that they're struggling with getting a job or the fact that you know they are in recovery and trying to have their kids return to their lives and so forth you, you're not doing the whole job, and and that's what we really have to be about, you know, going forward. And so that requires either having arrays of services that you can really be flexible with in terms of in terms of customizing for families, or it requires. And Brother Michael and I have done this a lot. It requires a lot of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, you know, kind of the era of the soul social service or nonprofit organization really really needs to be behind us in, in, in a sense. We really need to we, we need to work together in a much more um, positive way in a much more proactive way. Well, and we'll turn now over to Brother Michael, and I know that, that both of you have been long allies and colleagues, and everything that Ben and his colleagues do at his agency <coughs> either make or break how big a caseload oh, is for you, yeah. right? Because it's a continuum, and if prevention can happen early <coughs> and successfully yep. with keeping kids in school, then they're less likely to become involved in, directly in the juvenile justice system. But why don't we take a pause now and ask you, Brother Michael, what Tides Family Services does and who do you serve? We serve DCYF youngsters, both child welfare and juvenile justice youngsters. Um, and um, in both cases, I just want to add right away, our office in Woonsocket is right in Ben's office. Okay. And, and it's the perfect marriage because as we have children home with their families and our youngsters and we're doing prevention work, Think of all the things that our families need, most of whom live in poverty and the mm -hmm. services, and without his services, we cannot stabilize the family because we can go out and, and visit, which we do. We visit the families in general three times a day, seven days a week. We're there when they need us. We're on call. We solve problems right away. We help families learn how to parents, parent, and we're right and connect. And that was the idea a number of years ago when we joined and we moved in. So the new alliance simply took the three of us that were working together and we're still very much so together to provide the total array of services. In the uh, other main area that we do that you would be interested in, in juvenile justice is we are the major referral for youngsters out of the state training school. And we have a special project called the Youth Transition Center 
in Pawtucket and in Providence, probation workers actually work out of our building. So when we have meetings with the youngsters, probation workers are there. And again, we try to connect with other members of the community. Uh, these youngsters are in there on a condition of their release from the training school. And over the years, it's been proved very effective. We also recently completed the SAMHSA grant in conjunction with the department, three years. And we use CBDT, which is a drug counseling kind of a program, since most of the youngsters in there uh, coming out of training school have some substance issues. And very happy to report that we had very great statistics. Yale University evaluated it. We had a very successful group of 70 young men that left us and women. And, and the data was, again, very encouraging that the place to go and to work with them is in the community. Mm -hmm. That's where they go back to. Mm -hmm. So we're faced with a dilemma, particularly in the poorer areas, where to protect a youngster, DCYF removes the youngster. But in removing the youngster, where do they learn the skills to deal with the family and to deal in the community? And by the way, I don't know if we recorded Elizabeth and kids count, but it's amazing how many of our kids, when they're out of the jurisdiction of the court, run right back to the situation that the court removed them from for their own protection. So I think that's something to keep in mind, that uh, working in the community is very successful. Parents are very interested. You know, sometimes people say the uh, parents don't care, they don't come to a meeting. When you go to the house at 8 o'clock at night, they're there and they yes. want to know how's my son or daughter doing. And they simply have jobs and usually single parents where they can't take time off from work. So I want to be clear with people because frequently I get that they don't care about their children. That is not true at all. They very much so care and they relish the fact that we can combine and provide services to help them maintain and learn better skills to parenting and holding a family together. Well, if we can switch back to you, Ben, I know I'm um, just looking in the Kids Count Factbook, which is always in my lap, mm -hmm. that um, there are about 2,200 what they call indicated cases of child abuse and neglect every year in Rhode mm -hmm. Island. That stayed pretty, pretty stable. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are about 2,010 children removed from the home and placed into out-of-home placements. And, and I know as we've been tracking this, the number of children in out-of-home placements has been pretty steadily declining mm -hmm. thanks to a lot of earlier intervention and community-based work. Mm -hmm. We're starting to see that level off and start to go up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are some of the things that viewers who don't know much about the child welfare system need to know about sort of the early, less involved stage and then how it escalates? If you can kind of give a little sense to sort of the way the picture works for child abuse and neglect. Well, Poverty is, is huge with child abuse and neglect, and if you look at child abuse systems across the country, um, about 67 to 70 percent of, of kids that become, or families that become involved with child welfare systems are there because of poverty. And so in terms of early stage prevention, that should tell you something in terms of, in yes. terms of really trying to work with families at points in time when they're still intact, they're less stressed, um, they are they're doing their best in terms of making ends meet and so forth. To, to neglect those issues basically um, basically indicates that over time that group of families is going to going to have more and more problems so all of the all of the sort of human service challenges you hear us talking about in the state affordable housing um, decrease in snap benefits um, employment and training uh, GED you know all of these things have an impact in in the long term um, child abuse and neglect is not just about poor parenting and I think that I think that one of the misnomers here is that there's really a lack of appreciation um, about the fact that the parents that we're dealing with in, in fact are under tremendous stress and 
the neglect occurs at times because they're trying to make ends meet, because at times they may be trying to, to work other jobs, or, becomes, or because they've lost hope and they've, they've begun to use substances and other things in terms of trying to deal with their own emotional difficulties. So we really need to do a much better job of, of looking at families early. We need to work with families when children are babies. Um, or prenatally. Um, we need to work with parents um, when, um, before kids get, at a, get older and, and uh, we can work with them in terms of some of the mental health uh, difficulties they have um, and also attend to them in terms of you know, basic needs, employment, housing, those sorts of things. I mean, if we did the basics, we would probably see you know, th those numbers declining substantially. And we have seen that. We've seen some of that through the Family Care Community Partnership that the uh, department, uh, the DCY have instituted a few years ago, which really focuses on families at earlier stages, works with their strengths, work, works with informal as well as formal supports, and really tries to get to them before situations become out of control and, and so forth. Well, it sounds like that is a, an, an element of a successful plan to get in there early and to do prevention. Um, so with family um, care community partnerships, which we call FCCPs, mm -hmm. of which you are ahead of one for the region in which um, your agency sits in Northern Rhode Island, are you getting the support that you need, not just your FCCP, but the rest? Um, and what is the cost benefit, do, in your view, of investing fully and as needed in FCCPs compared to the cost of failure down the road? Well, one of the, one of the immediate cost benefits is we've seen caseloads at DCYF um, decrease with more intervention at what we refer to as the front end. So the more, so the more effort we put at trying to address families' needs um, at early crisis points as opposed to sometimes when Brother Michael gets involved in the situation, um, there's, a, there's a significant um, cost benefit. There's a cost benefit in terms of families not becoming involved in the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. There's a cost benefit in terms of, of uh, kids not being placed in foster care, which, which can be you know, a path to trauma and academic difficulties and, and other things. Um, so, the, so the cost benefit is, is, is quite significant. The problem has been in this state that we have over time over invested in very expensive placement level care, if you will, as opposed to investing in the front end and investing in community-based services. And, this is not something that can happen overnight. Most states that have done it have not done it overnight. They've not done it in one or two years. It's taken five or ten years in, in some respects. But, um, but it has to be done in order, in order to really change the dynamic. So it, it's the issue that was recently brought up by the Casey report, which as we talked about earlier, um, is very similar to uh, our children, our responsibility, Correct. which is very similar to uh, former Representative Nancy Benoit's op-ed a little over a year ago yep. about how uh, it, it only makes sense to get in there early, to really divide up the state into regions, and to have that kind of wraparound early intervention. And I know that you know we're just coming off um, a legislative session. I know that there have been some leaders in the General Assembly really looking at. Um, how to restore some funding that was cut to FCCPs, and mm -hmm. we'll soon find out what the outcome of that is, but it sounds like it's just urgently needed to keep those FCCPs whole and functioning and keeping these caseloads down. It is, it is. I mean, it's the difference, it's the difference between really turning some families away from the child welfare system, from family court, and so forth, and and uh, keeping them you know, more focused on what they can do in terms of resolving their, their difficulties with supports from, from the community. We, we know and we have known for a long time that that is the, that is the better path. Um, it is not 100% successful, but we know that it can be successful most of the time. Well, that's a good jumping off point to look at, at 
older youth primarily that um, have started to get involved with the juvenile justice system. Again, we see poverty as a huge piece of that, which I might add does not mean that all poor kids get involved with the juvenile justice system. It means Correct. that they are at increased risk of involvement. So let me just set the stage with a few statistics here. I know that you have also seen um, and been a part of you know, helping to see the numbers of of youth that are incarcerated at the training school come down pretty significantly in the past five or six years. I think our statistics show that the caseload at in any given day at the training school was a high of around 215 um, back in around two, 2006, and now the average daily population is around 83. So that's a very good number in the right direction. Right. And in addition, the other thing we track is um, the number of kids that during the course of a year are are at the training school for one or more nights. And that used to be a high of around 1,100 kids, and now it's about 408. So Brother Michael, what would you um, sort of give credit for in terms of this very significant trend, which I might add is seen in Rhode Island as well as other parts of the country as well? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the juvenile uh, D, uh, JDAI, <clears throat> as, you know, it's through the Casey Foundation task force that's been working for a number of years where we've been taking a look at that. We've been developing the scale on what youngsters on the scale, the family court, you know, and the police can conjunctually, can agree to do not belong in a, in, in a facility. The training school has also started the program where they've invited several agencies in who do strictly community-based programming to interview the youth interview the family and make a recommendation as to whether or not those youngsters could be sent home and then go to family court with it. And I believe programs like that <clears throat> have really been extremely successful since there are a number of young people in there who really don't need the training school. And, and over the course of this between the JDAI uh, this part of it and that you know we can really demonstrate that it works again I want to come back to this because I think people just don't don't get it I hear so many times they don't care it's not true when you come in and you go to the house and you meet with them and they know you're serious and they know you're coming when there's a crisis they joined. That is something that really it's connects them. It's a partnership them. Mm -hmm. and then, to get their child back right. on track, back engaged in yeah. school, and leading a productive yeah. life. And right? then one of the things we were able to do with Ben and in uh, and, and resources with Chris with the two programs merging is access psychiatric services. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we're not, we don't have that capability. And in our initial work together, as we were then able to get the psychiatric services that either parents or the youth needed directly working with us as opposed to a clinician sitting in an office monitoring the case for the psychiatrist, but they never out in the community. They don't know mm -hmm. who these kids are hanging with. So, I mean, I just want to come back to that. That, it that really the prevention is, services the of prevention mental health. prevention services, mm -hmm. mental health and everything, when we, we, take, we take it and we put it out here, and nobody's in connection with the community. How do we really expect it to work? What magic happens when you put that sure. young know, in that family? It just doesn't work. So I think it's a combination of things that Ben's been talking about, and the data is pretty clear. The more we commit to community, and the more we go out and we do it, and I would tell you that we, we had a case, and it was really depressing. This little girl was in residential for seven years, Meaning a residential, a residential out of home facility. Out of home home facility. Kind of and we're trying to, at one point, this goes back to, in time, to reunite her. And the department was very good. And we were able to get different agencies to work together. But this little girl would run away. She was turning 18, DCYF. She had no skills. She only knew what she remembered from being there and what she learned in a residential, which is fine in a residential but doesn't work in the streets. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's touch and go, but that's what I want people to understand. You know, when you remove them and they have nothing left in the community, they're gonna go back to that community. Right, and they're and, not and, gonna be prepared. Yeah, and then when she gets pregnant, if she gets pregnant, we have a, a young mom who was never parented. So I will tell you from experience having to counsel the number of young ladies, it's not uncommon when 
they have their first child. They don't know how to parent. And thank right. God they call the agency. But, you, but Brother Michael, I think what you've said to me so many times is you don't want that cycle to repeat itself. That's right. That's right. So we're running close to the end of time, if you can believe it. Tell yeah. me one quick success story of a youth that is an example of what can happen if you get in there early and you get things turned around. Yeah, I remember she was, uh, and I'll go back because this ties in both of that, and she was terrible in school. She was thrown out of school. The parents were faced with a decision of putting her in family court on a voluntary, getting her involved. They made a decision not to. We kept her in the community, and we were able to work through that. And she now is successfully working. She has a job. And a while back, when her son became 13, she called me up. And she, we had a nice talk. I hadn't talked to her. She said, brother, she says, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I don't know what to do with my son. And I said, well, I didn't think you would. But she again right away got involved in the counseling because yeah. she wanted help with parenting. And to this day, the son has never gone back, and she continues to work. And I think that's what this is all about. It might sound simple, but this is a this kind is of basic it's needs. Mm -hmm. It's all about this, caring mm -hmm. in the community, and it works. So thank you, Brother Michael. And Ben, um, I know that there's been what seems like a huge spike in substance abuse cases and tragic deaths as a result of substance use. How is that having an impact on kids in the child welfare system right now? Placements are going up. Mm -hmm. Placements are going up. And, and, uh, and, uh, and one of the things that is a, a problem in our state is that there's a real disconnect between systems, between the child welfare system and the behavioral health system. So we really need to be much more strategic about how we how we, we utilize behavioral health resources to support what's happening in, in child welfare. We operate a, um, a visitation program that really specializes with families whose parents have substance use and behavioral health needs. And, and so we do a lot of partnering with behavioral health clinicians and so forth. But if th those resources, in addition to the child welfare resources that we bring to the table, weren't there, um, parents would not be in a position to reunify with their kids. So you really need to you really need to do much more integration at the systems level and and at the community level in terms of bringing all of these resources to bear for, for families. And unless we're able to do that, unless we're able to be more strategic about how we deploy resources, how we spend our funds, and, and so forth, we're going to continue to see the same kinds of the uh, the same kinds of you know placement issues and so forth that, that we've seen. You know, child welfare is not you know a country unto itself. It has to be integrated with with other supports and resources in the community, or else it will not work. Well, we're coming to the end of our time together. Um, I know that you will be bo both very active in what seems like an opportune moment right now to really figure out a plan for Rhode Island going forward. Are you hopeful that that can be pulled off first, Ben, and then Brother Michael? And very quickly, unfortunately, because we're coming up on time. I, I hope so. We have an opportunity. We have an op we have an election coming up in the next few months, and I think that we have. We have a strategic opportunity to do that, and so my hope is that the next governor is really going to look at this and really look at, at the fact that human services is not dis disconnected from economic development. If you do not do human services well, you're going to have a problem with economic development. So, I, so my hope is that the, the next governor will really embrace that and, and move forward with it. Well, I hope you concur with what Ben Lessing just said. <laughs> Brother Michael, thank you so much for being on the program. Ben Lessing, uh, thank you, and thank you for both for your leadership. And thank you for joining us for Access Rhode Island and its program Kids Count. Thanks for joining us.